So uh, my name's Joe uh, Greco, Chelsea Joe Sport Fishing Charter. Some of you guys may have heard of us. Uh, Dad's been on the lake for a long time. Um, you know, growing up, that's all pretty much all I ever fished for was lake trout and salmon, some bass. And I really got into walleye fishing because, you know, I didn't know a lot about it. Um, you know, growing up, catching lake trout and salmon every summer, I was just kind of like, you know, what else can I learn about around here? I'm, I really like to go and figure things out for myself. Um, going out, exploring, and, you know, seeing, seeing what I can learn about things. And while I was one of those fish. So I started fishing for them. So the things we're going to cover today, we're going to talk about, uh, you know, where are there walleyes around here? Um, how many guys are walleye fishermen out here? A few, hopefully a lot more by the end of this. Uh, hopefully by the end of the seminar, you guys are going to have to stock up on tartar sauce because you're going to all become walleye fishermen. Um, walleye are a delicious fish. Some people say they're the best eating freshwater fish. Um, I'm kind of partial to perch myself. I do like to eat walleyes, but perch are pretty much, I think they're pretty hard to beat. Uh, so we're going to talk about the fish. We're going to talk about, you know, how I approach walleye fishing. Some of my favorite places to go. Uh, one of them being Sacandaga Lake. Any of you guys fish Sacandaga? Okay. The reservoir. Um, Sacandaga to me is, is probably my favorite place to fish because it's a walleye paradise. Um, a 20 inch fish is a big fish in there. Uh, usually we can get into some good, good numbers of fish in Sacandaga. But uh, the great Sacandaga, not the little Sacandaga. That's a good point. Um, the little Sacandaga, I honestly, I've never fished it. I hear there's big fish in there, but uh, it's just too far. Quite frankly, there's other places closer I'd rather fish. But the great Sacandaga, you know, there's a lot of opportunity there. I fish the northern eastern section a lot. Um, I can tell you... I can count on one hand the amount of ice fishermen I've ever seen up there, ever. Nobody fishes it. Um, I've had some of my best days up there. If you get out and explore, I'm gonna show you how I use my electronics. I'm gonna show you what I'm looking for to set up. Um, I called this uh, whole seminar ice trapping walleyes and that's because that's kind of how I think about tip up fishing. You know, you're setting traps. You're putting a specific tip up exactly in one spot um, based on the structure that you're on. Okay. Growing up ice fishing, you know, what, what did a, a lot of guys do? Well, you got to put your tip ups in a straight line, right? Put them in a straight line. That way you can see the flags go up. You know, when you're probably a 12 pack in and you got one eye open, <laughs> you can look out and you, you can see your flags a little bit easier. That's not what we're trying to do. Um, it's just like running a trap line. You know, you want, each tip up in a very specific spot, and we're gonna talk about how we do that. So, where'd my markers go here? I'm big on diagrams. Um, the first thing we're gonna do is talk about calendar periods, okay? Calendar periods are basically what each fish is doing throughout the year. Each fish has a different thing that it does every month um, throughout these periods based on its life cycle, okay? Um, my buddy Shiloh, he's a big salmon fisherman. He could probably tell you everything a salmon does from ice on to ice out. Um, it's completely different from what a walleye does. Their spawning habits are different, their feeding habits are different. You know, the more you learn about each fish species, the more you're gonna figure out their patterns throughout the year, okay? And we're gonna talk about how that pertains to ice fishing. Um, so the things I key in on with walleye, let's talk about the phases of what they do throughout the year. Um, so we got the spawn. All right, everybody knows walleye spawn usually somewhere uh, in March, April, in that range. Um, the reason that's so critical, even though the season's usually closed during the spawn, is pre-spawn can be a very good time. Yes. <laughs> post spawn can be a very good time okay so we'll go right through we'll go right through the calendar periods um, as I kind of envision them um, in fisherman puts out a great series 
for each fish species. You should buy the books. Um, I have the one on walleye. I have the one on crappie. I have the one on um, lake trout. Read that thing cover to cover several times and it's gonna really enlighten you on a lot of things, okay? You can get them at Walmart. Um, a lot of Walmarts carry them, obviously the bookstore, you can probably get them online. In Fisherman, whatever the name of the fish is, highly suggest you read it, okay? Um, and they kind of break this down into calendar periods. They break down each species of fish into calendar periods because as you progress through the seasons, you should be thinking about what the fish is doing, okay? So we start with the spawn. Uh, we go to post-spawn. All right, the fish are done spawning. Can be a really good time, can be a really tough time. Um, not gonna spend too much time on that, that's another seminar because we're getting into open water season now. So we have the post spawn, we have the summer period, which can be excellent fishing. That's kind of, uh, you know, once things stabilize after the spawn, uh, once the ecosystem comes to life and, uh, you know, everything's kind of happening in full swing, uh, that can be a really good time to fish walleyes also, okay? Um, from summer, I'm gonna go into turnover period, okay? And we're going to talk about that for a minute, but again, we're not going to spend a ton of time on that. This is probably the toughest time of the year to catch walleyes and many other fish, um, warm water species. The reason is because it's a time of instability. Uh, you know, it's usually that tail end of September, the first week of October, we start to get those first cold nights. All right, things all of a sudden go from the fish being in 82 degree water every day, which is late August surface temps you know now all of a sudden those surface temps they go down boom 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 every day you know you get a couple nights in the 30s and 40s and it throws everything out of whack um, that period of time can last for a couple weeks this year um, if you guys remember October was a really kind of a tough month with the weather because we were kind of in this transition where summer was just didn't want to stop we had those really warm weeks in late September. It just kept going into October. And uh, that can make for really tough fall, tough fall fishing because you don't get that boom, all of a sudden everything turns over. Um, you get a consistent water temperature throughout the water column. And then now you're into the next phase. Okay, so turnover is an interesting thing. Um, usually the water temps are gonna be somewhere in the 60s, I would say. And um, it's just at the time of instability for the ecosystem and the fish. And at that time, I generally don't fish for walleye, okay? This is a very good time to fish Lake George for salmon because it's a bigger body of water, um, different species. That's, it's just a time of year, I'll, I'll just do something else, okay? After turnover, uh, that's when we go into the fall, which marks the beginning of the cold water period, okay? That usually, if I could put a temperature on that, it would be somewhere in the 50s, mid to low 50s. These are surface temps, of course. So once that happens, um, again, you've gotten stability in the ecosystem. The fish all adjust to what's going on. The water temps are very consistent. Um, this is also a time period where the night bite is gonna start to turn on. Um, the fish are gonna set up in certain areas, which we're gonna talk about in a little bit. And it's also uh, the time period just before first ice, all right? This is really one of the only phases we're concerned about today because it's gonna mark that period right before first ice and you're gonna try to lock onto that pattern, which is gonna take you into the first couple weeks of the season, okay? Um, so pretty much that's kind of how I take myself through the year walleye fishing, okay? So we're gonna talk about first ice now. So after the late fall, we're gonna look at uh, what they call the frozen water period, okay? All right. So it's important to know, obviously, fish do different things on different lakes, right? Um, 
perch fishermen, you know, Lake George, you might be catching them in 30 to 35 feet. You go to Saratoga Lake, you might be catching them in 20 feet. You go to your grandfather's pond, they're in 10 feet. Primarily because the pond is only 10 feet deep. But you get what I'm saying. You're not going to catch perch everywhere in 10 feet of water. And the same thing's true with walleye. So let's look at some typical locations. Um, generally by this time period, you have a lot of fish in shallow during feeding periods. You're going to be looking for feeding areas. You're going to be looking for weeds. Um, current. Fall walleyes are very drawn to current. Um, it can be natural currents in the lake created by structure. It can be inlets, small stream inlets. Um, if there's any flow, you know, flowages, flow, you know, rivers or anything like that that flow into the lake, they're going to be very attracted to that in the fall. That's a good place to start looking for first ice walleyes. Okay, um, but also weeds. People always think walleyes and rocks. You know, you got to have rocks and. You know, walleyes are very much attracted to weeds, and that's because there's bait in there. Um, they can get out of the sun in there. There's oxygen there. You know, walleyes, many other warm water species, you'll find them all together in the weeds for size. Okay. Also, guys, at any point, uh, feel free to ask questions. I like questions. If there's a question just bothering you, just please ask it. Blurt it out. I got a little cheat sheet over here, make sure I'm not missing anything. So, good walleye fisheries around here. Sacandaga Lake, Saratoga Lake, Tom Hannock Reservoir. Anybody ever fish the Tom Hannock Reservoir? There you go. That's a great, great fishery. Um, no boats allowed. You cannot put a boat on that body of water. So it's got to be pretty good fishing, right? Um, those are primarily, you know, your three big walleye fisheries, and they're all very different. Uh, Saratoga, Tom Hannock, both fairly weedy. Sacandaga, you'd have a lot of trouble finding weeds in there. Um, those fish relate to rocks and sand transitions and wood. All right. Um, get a good sight imaging unit. On Sacandaga, uh, it'll help you break the water down. It'll help you locate structure save those tracks, return to them on the ice, and fish them. That's the best information I can give you. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, so, typical, uh, typical areas for fish to set up in in the fall. Deep, steep structure adjacent to weeds. Okay? Um, fish in the fall will relate to steep structure in deep water because they can get away from unstable uh, weather conditions. Okay, um, if I could draw it out, you got a deep basin of the lake, you got a steep break, okay, this being shore. Um, so usually what you'll have is some sand. You got your weed growth in here, and then it stops growing, okay. The key to walleye fishing weeds is finding weed edges. All right, weeds grow at different depths in different lakes. Um, there's some Adirondack lakes where you'll find different kinds of weeds at different depths. You might have some shallow grass in five feet. You might have milfoil beds in 10 feet. You might have really deep cabbage in 20 feet. The key is finding the edge, okay, and finding the structure near those edges. Walleyes are creatures of edges. Um, it could be temperature. It could be sand to rock transitions. It could be wood. It doesn't matter what it is. They use those like highways. They're feeding lanes. Okay. Um, so classic walleye pattern in the fall. You got this scenario here. You got a lot of bait fish. Um, if I could imagine myself going to walleye heaven for ice, this is what it would look like. You got some kind of current coming into this area. Maybe it's a weedy bay. Um, fed by some kind of tributary. This breaks off into a really deep basin. Deep is a relative term, maybe 25 to 30 feet. Okay, you got a lot of fish loafing here in uh, the middle of the day. Sun starts to come down. It's 4.30, 5 o'clock, you're getting bored, nothing's happening, your tip-ups are just sitting there. 
Occasionally you'll catch bat all kinds of bass. Uh, if you're in a good walleye spot with bass, you know, good walleye lake that's got a lot of bass or perch, you should be going crazy chasing flags. And a lot of times I won't even drill holes until about four, 4.30 for that reason, or else uh, you're just donating money to the lake. Um, all of a sudden, boom, you get that first flag. It's probably a walleye. And what's happening is, like clockwork, they'll do this in the fall um, on open water, and that's, that's gonna last, you know, probably for the first couple weeks of first ice. And it's just the pattern they get into. And they'll work their way in the ledge. They'll hit this weed line. And generally what they do is they just go back and forth on that weed line. And you'll watch your tip ups, bing, 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 bing. And then it's over, usually, you know, by sunset. Um, at that point, what I'll do is I'll start focusing on this area here, okay? Generally, you know, what I hear a lot is, well, we hammered them. The sun went down, we hammered them, and then they, they were all done. Well, they weren't done. They moved, okay? They're going in shallower. Um, the walleyes in the fall, they'll go into very shallow water and just lay there because there's usually the young of the year bait fish, you know, they're still in the weeds and they'll just hang out there all night and they'll ambush them, okay? Um, so keep that in mind. You know, if you're gonna make an all day event out of it, drill out into some deeper water, you're gonna have a transitional bite here and then you're gonna potentially have a really good night bite in shallower, all right? Um, we'll talk about how to find the weed lines. That's another question I get a lot. Go ahead. In the shallows, are you worried about like you pre-drill your holes? Yes. You Good point. Have everything pre-drilled. Um, if you're going to go in the morning, early in the morning, generally I won't even, I'll just forget about this. I'll have all my holes cut, all my sets in before the sun comes, well before the sun comes up, still in the dark. <laughs> That's critical. Um, Good point. And a lot of times, you know, I'll be out. And it's 7.30, 8 o'clock, and then, you know, two or three guys come out walleye fishing, and it's over. The bite's over, okay? You got to get out there early. I was going to say, would you reverse that pattern for the morning? I can hear you mention that. But... You could. I mean, generally, I don't get up really early and try to, you know, get onto the shallow fish because it's so shallow. You're probably just going to blow them out of there. But um, you want to have all this stuff pre-done, pick your sets up, move them in. Move them in skinnier. But you were talking Sacandaga, how shallow are you? Uh, sack and Daga, generally the same, three to five feet okay. or less. I mean, you probably have a tough time getting into any shallower than that. Right. What are you using for a mineral selection? Are you seeing any rate? That's a great question. I was hoping somebody would ask that. Um, minnow selection is really interesting. Uh, I have a lot of buddies that they got to have um, baby suckers. I gotta have suckers, they gotta be this big. Nobody has them and this and that. I've never used a baby sucker. Um, maybe they. Maybe I would do even better, I don't know. I don't think it matters a whole heck of a lot as long as you have lively bait. Walleyes are a fish that live and die by vibration, okay? The livelier the minnow, the better. I like hunts a lot because they wiggle faster um, versus a shiner where they kinda, they get doing this a lot. But um, I, I've, gone back and forth with it. And I think on certain lakes, maybe certain things work better. I like hunts a lot and I like hunts on Sacandaga a lot because I think that profile of bait fish makes more sense to the, the smaller, thinner stuff they eat in there versus Saratoga Lake, for example, when the primary food source is baby bluegills, small sunfish, whereas a shiner has that white belly, that thinner, wider profile, okay? But uh, the jury's still out on the bait. You're fishing at shallow water, or are you fishing on uh, bottom? Or in the water column? You get in the really skinny water, all your activity is above the fish's head. Put it right under the ice. All right, you get on the weed lines, I'm usually up two to three feet. Um, never far from bottom, but also you don't have to, you know, hit it with your sounder and then you gotta be right on bottom. You know, they'll find it. Um, once they get into that five foot cone of the, of the bait fish, they already know it's there, they can feel it. They come in and, and bam, all right? So now that scenario there was uh, kind of,
kind of a weedy, you know, more of a weedy lake scenario. Now we're gonna talk about sack and dog a little bit, all right? Um, you guys use Navionics? Everybody have Navionics. If you follow this formula, I can just about guarantee you're gonna stumble upon some good spots. And um, again, ice trap and walleyes. The reason I call it that is because it's a very systematic way of setting up a spread. You're letting them work, all right? You're either gonna hit the jackpot or you're not. It's just like any other trapping system. It's just like guys fishing crabs, um, you know, on deadliest catch. They set everything out. If they're in a productive area, it's gonna work. You know, walleyes are not a hard fish to catch. If you're on them, they're generally gonna bite. You're gonna catch them at the right time of day. Um, I can tell you, <clears throat> I can go out on Sacandaga with a group of three or five guys and um, I'll draw one scenario up. This is the basin. I should say just an area of the basin. Um, and there might really not be anything out there. Okay. But you might have maybe an underwater point that looks like this. All right. Now you got to remember that's flooded farmland and there's old houses. There's, um, you know, if you drive around out there with side imaging, I mean, you'll see all kinds of trees, blowdowns, foundations, rock roads. Uh, there's all kinds of crap out there. Um, so you might see something like this, and this is a spot that I fish regularly. And uh, what it is, is it's a corner of an old foundation of a house. Okay. Now, just looking at the map, you can already tell there's some um, bottom transitions here just by seeing it because if, if it wasn't, then it wouldn't be there. Okay. Um, so these are all contour lines, this being deep water, this being a shallower flat. But this is very, I mean, you're talking, this might be 14 feet and this might be 16 here. And that might not seem like a lot, but out in the basin of that lake where there's nothing, that's very attractive to fish and that's very attractive to bait. All right. So a lot of times what I'll do is, you know, anytime you're fishing a point, you always want something on the tip, down the sides, on the deeper edges. And maybe you put two, two up high on the top, maybe you put one up in the flat. All right, and that's your, that's your six tip up spread, assuming you're using one for jigging. Um, so anyways, we went out there with a group of guys one day <clears throat> and we just had this whole, whole thing plastered. My one buddy up here, he was up here in La La Land and he never got one flag up there and we were catching them left and right off of this point. And I mean, that's just a very good example of how these fish use structure and how with your contour maps, your Navionics, you know, get right out there and make sure every one of those tip ups you put out counts, put it in a spot. You know, you might not get anything over here, but over here you might be lighting them up left and right. You know, then next time you go back, you know where to go. Okay, and that's how you do it. Um, if anybody, anybody that fishes sack and dog probably knows where the trap islands are. Um, you got, I'm gonna draw a really terrible picture of the sack and dog, but it'll be helpful. So basically this is what they call Sinclair point. You guys hear of that? Um, you got Sand Island, you got Scout Island. All right. That's a channel that goes in between Scout Island and shore, basically. Um, out here in the middle of the lake, this is what they call the Trap Islands. And it's basically just a giant submerged island, really steep around the edges. Um, I could probably put 15 guys anywhere on that and they'd all catch fish. It's a great spot. All right, get out there and fish that. Um, there's a lot of series of points, sunken points out here, okay? Like that. Um, anywhere you go out there, you set up on the edges of those, put some up a little higher, put some down towards the base of the breaks, and you're gonna catch fish. Deep out there, right? Eh, 
The Sacandaga is, for one thing, uh, the, the water levels fluctuate. So in the summertime, you'll be in 30 feet of water. Most of that basin is, is 30-ish. They lower the water in the fall. Now you're looking at maybe 20, 25. This year, probably even less because everything was really low. Um, so be mindful of that. Uh, you'll find that certain structures are better than others at certain times of the year. Um, a lot of the areas that I fish in the summertime, um, early in the spring, they'll be good. In the summer, they'll slow down. And then in the winter, again, they're good. What about that area just south of Northampton? When the water goes out, there's like old buildings and there's a road. There's actually roads there. Yeah. It's all sandy. I don't know how deep that is when the water's in. That can be very good in the springtime. Yep. Um, so, is it? They didn't the Kenyan Islands too. Okay. Interesting. Um, so at a glance, you know, you have you have um, old river channels that wind through here. This is the section out past Glen uh, Northville. All right, you got an old river channel that goes through here. Okay. Um, very good first ice, and also late ice. Again, you get into here and you follow this old river channel. Now in the summertime, that sometimes that's up to 50 to 60 feet deep, all right? I've never really found fish down that deep. It seems like it's almost too deep. Um, you know, summer walleyes, if I could put a, a depth on it, it's, it's usually, it's a 30 foot thing. They're very attracted to 30 feet most of the year, especially in the summertime. It's just a good loafing kind of a comfort zone for them to hang out in. And what happens is this river channel, um, you got a lot of blowdowns in here. All right. And over time, probably just because of current, um, you got a lot of log jams and stuff like that that are sunken. And if you go through there with side imaging, you're going to find some really good wood piles. All right. The walleyes there, they love wood. Um, it's a great place for them to ambush bait. It's a really overlooked pattern for walleyes is, is finding them in wood. But um, if you ever fish that and you find those blowdowns, remember them, mark them, put them on your GPS. Um, another uh, thing to remember about Sacandaga is the Northern Pike predation on the walleyes is unbelievable. Probably at least three times a summer, I'll reel in a 10 inch walleye and have a northern pike come up and eat it. No exaggeration. Um, I'm convinced that's why the pike gets so big in there. Uh, there's a really good population of walleye in the Sacandaga and the more you fish it, the better you're gonna understand. Um, the GSLFF, the Great Sacandaga Lake uh, Fisheries Federation, anybody a member? Great, great uh, bunch of guys. They really help out with stocking and, um, you know, they do a lot of good programs for the lake and really have a good pulse on what's going on with it. But, uh, a lot of good contests too. And a lot of good fishing contests. And, you know, I think uh, just the diligent stocking has really helped the population of walleyes in there. Um, so let's go through the process of setting up. Uh, first thing in the morning. I always want to be set up in the dark, all right? Show up in the dark, obviously. Get your stuff out using your map. All right, you should already have an idea of where you're headed. Um, you, you should already know how you're gonna lay your spread out and everything in the dark, all right? Um, safety, gonna talk about safety because I have gone through in the dark. Uh, you gotta know where you're going, get out there, cut holes. Uh, make sure there's plenty of ice, and that's something I don't always do. I always assume there's plenty of ice, and uh, <laughs> I know it sounds crazy, but uh, it can happen. You know, I'm out there a couple times a week at least, and you know, you get into this mentality where you just forget about safety sometimes, and just please get yourself some of those ice picks. Know where you're going before you guys go out and do this you know, what, the way I'm about to describe, because it's dark, all right? 
Um, I was on the northern section a couple of years ago, and this was one of the winters when it was really warm for a few days, it got cold for a few days. Uh, I went down to this one area that I fish, cut a few holes, plenty of ice, six, seven inches of ice, um, moving water up there, okay? Basically, it's a river. You got to be careful. I go out there day of, and it's just one of those days where it's pitch black, you know, no moonlight. Get a couple sets out, take a few more steps out. I cut another hole. It's only about four inches. Danger. Okay, I get it. I take about another 20 steps and I'm noticing water. And what happened was the whole middle of that channel opened up and I was shining my light onto what I thought was glare ice and it was actually open water. And I went right through, okay? If I didn't have those spikes, I wouldn't have gotten out because I tried to get out. The ice just kept breaking. And if I didn't have the, you know, I was able to pull myself out with those. Make sure you got, if you don't have them, get them and wear them all the time. Critical. I would not be here today without those. Uh, so anyway, that's the spiel on safety. So you already have your location picked out, all right? Um, what I'll do in the morning, I'll go right to my spot. Um, in Sacandaga, a lot of times the area I'm fishing, they're, they're a lot bigger than they look on the maps. Even though, you know, on contour lines, tight lines together means steep structure. A lot of times you'll get out on those breaks, they'll actually be a lot more gradual than you think. It's a big area, okay? It's a big body of water, it's very flat. Um, and even the stuff that looks steep on avionics may not be. So it's good to go out with a, a bunch of guys and really, you know, plaster it good with tip-ups and figure out what the fish are doing. Um, here's another common scenario. This is what I would call um, a creek channel inside turn. Somewhere where the creek winds like this or this. Those are very attractive places for fish to move on to shallower structure. Are you talking okay. about river channel? Yes, this would be the old river channel. Now in the summertime, what I have already found is there's, there's huge blowdowns maybe here. Okay. What you're going to want to do, you show up in the dark, get all your holes cut, and, and just start surrounding this area. They might be using this channel here. Uh, they might be right on top. You might catch a few fish right on top. You might catch them on this flat over here. But get your stuff set up before dark. That way when the sun comes up, the bite's going to turn on and you're going to be ready to catch fish. Okay? And you're going to learn a lot about the lake because, you know, there might be a small cobblestone, um, you know, like you'd find in the woods deer hunting. There's a lot of those in there. There's a lot of cobblestone uh, old fences and rock walls that just go forever and ever. Um, you might have a tip up here and here, and you might catch, you know, four or five fish on those tip ups and nothing anywhere else. The reason is because they're using this rock wall. Okay. And that's, that's how you learn about that lake. All right. If you use your maps, uh, you're going to learn very quickly. You're going to learn a lot of good spots. Just go to areas that look good. Those classic steep breaks into deep water. Are you fishing the edge of the drop-offs at all on that? Yes. Channel? Yep. Edges of drop-offs. But again, sometimes they might not be there. Um, I like to go to spots where there might be two or three little rock piles in the middle of nowhere. Uh, or little humps or whatever. I'll have tip-ups on those, even if I have to go 100 yards or so to get to them. Um, you know, that way you got a lot of things going on. And you're testing a lot of different areas in one outing, all right? You're gonna learn a lot about it. Go ahead. I was just wondering, treble or single hook, and what size? That's a good question. Um, again, I go back and forth. I love trebles, tens, okay. usually size tens. If you're going singles, I like a four or a two. Um, singles don't come out. That's the one thing I like about them. I also think when a walleye inhales a minnow, a lot of times it's kind of a it's a lazy bite and that treble hook is, it's stuck on the outside of their mouth and they might just swim around with it for a little bit. You go to set the hook, you miss the fish. 
whereas a single hook slides in, you know, they can kind of get that in the first gulp a lot easier. Um, that's my theory anyway. It's a coin toss. They're all designed to catch fish, you know. That's a good question, though. That's a good question, and we go back and forth with that on spoons, you know. In the northern end, there's a lot of uh, rock piles between beaches. Do you worry about them because they're not all that deep? Also, they're like boundaries between beaches. Do I worry about them as in? I do fish them. Oh, yeah. Um, I know what you're talking about, the big rock pile points that come down the beaches. Yep. I use them as boundary lines. Early in the season, yes. Mid-season, you're going to see a shift to main lake structure. That's primarily a water temperature thing because come late January and into the beginning of February, it's all about water temperature. Um, the warmest part of the lake is going to be the bottom of the lake. So then that main lake structure is, is going to be a lot more attractive to the, all the fish, the bait fish and, and whatnot. I do good with panties almost all year round there, but I've never put walleye on them. That's what I'm asking. Huh. No kidding. Yeah, I'm usually, I'm out in the middle of the lake most of the time. When you say northeastern, can you give us a, a landmark? Yeah, basically, um, well, everybody knows where the bridge is, Edinburgh Bridge. That's a great area. I mean, that Bachelorville Bridge, that holds fish all year. You know, it's, you could almost divide the Great Sack and Dogga into different lakes, you know, that being its own fishery. I mean, you could probably spend your whole life fishing that and not fish every spot in there. It's just, it's huge. How about further north? Um, I've done good up in the town of Day. I have a few spots up there. Near the Edinburgh Launch? Search of Launch? Not familiar with that, actually. <laughs> That's a fine. The town of Day Launch? Uh, That's not usually that side. But um, all in through there is good. You know, you get off of those deep points that drop into the main yeah. basin. and A lot of weeds in there, why I'm asking. Yeah. Yeah, I fished a lot of... Um, Stump fields up there? Yeah, a lot of them. It's a lot of and it's good. I mean, the Sacandaga is the kind of place you can go and catch one fish just about anywhere. You can go and catch a few. Uh, but you're really, you got to look for that biomass, you know, just like all the crab fishermen always say. There's always a concentration of fish in small areas of the lake, and, and you got to find them. Any place further north than that? that you're uh, not usually that far north. Where do you like to hook your minnow? Usually, right behind the dorsal, and I'm gonna I'm gonna get to some other things also here. Um, so this is another one of my setups. This is a slip bobber rig. Generally, if I feel like catching fish on a rod, I'll have two holes in my fish house. Um, early and late in the day, I'm not moving a whole lot. You know, I'm trying. I'm in one spot and I'm waiting for fish to come through. It's an ambush, and um, I'll have my holes pre-drilled, and I'll have the slip bobber rig on one, and I might only put four or five tip-ups out. Um, all this is is a number two, uh, it's a 32nd ounce crappy jig, okay? Split shot, slip bobber, Jeff has these upstairs. Um, what happens a lot of times, especially later in the season, you get a lot of customers. Customers are what I call fish that come onto the screen. They're, they see what's on the menu. They don't seem hungry. They don't want to bite. They go away. A lot of times, if you're starting to see a lot of fish show up and you, and you stop catching them on the jigs, a lot of times they'll see this minnow over here and they'll grab it, and you've called them right into the, you know, the area with the jig. So give that a shot. Um, I catch a lot of fish on this. You should put a on yep, and I lip hook them right through the tips of the lips. Usually they inhale this whole, they, they, you know, they see the color, they inhale this whole thing and I, I have them just about instantaneously. I don't miss a lot of fish, believe it or not, even though they're lip hooked because it's such a thin wire, um, it's such a really sharp thin hook, it sticks them pretty good quickly. But you'll catch a lot of fish on this. I have a lot of, a lot of fun with this. What's that? Why do you use the bobber? Um, because, well, you either have to, you'd have to just dead stick it with line out and then you, it's kind of hard to see what's going on there. Um, the bobber is just kind of a nice way to suspend your bait. It's almost like you're fishing on open water. And what I'll do is I'll have my bail open so the fish can take it. And I'll just let them take it for a few seconds, flip the bail over, <laughs> reel down the slack, set the hook. 
So it's kind of fun. It's a good visual way to to dead stick a minnow. Is all it is. What kind of hook was that? You said it's a um, it's a thirty second ounce. It's just a really light, crappy jig. And the reason I use a jig instead of a hook, it just it keeps that minnow from going anywhere. Because you got to remember, these fish are fairly lethargic, especially in the dead of winter. They don't want to have to chase it. They want something that's you know just it's wiggling, it's trying to get away, and they eat it. Um, I'll always use a pretty good size split shot above my hook for that reason, because that minnow can only go so far, and then he's struggling with the weight of the split shot, because they don't want to have to work for it. You know, um, and that's also why they eat a lot of perch and bluegills. Come evening, those fish become very inactive. A lot of times they'll just lay there and they can just go through and scoop them up. Um, you know, your faster bait fish, there's just, it's too fast for them. Their metabolism is so low at that time of the year. You know, they're not gonna bother with something that's too much effort. They'd rather just wait for an easy meal. Um, uh, mediums. Mediums are fine, nothing too small. Um, again, you know, they're opportunists. As long as you're not using pike shiners, you know, you're good. How far off the bottom are you usually? It depends on the where I'm fishing. Um, generally what I'll do with these, I hit bottom. I go six or eight cranks up. That's where I put it. Um, it's got to be and that's my bait, of course, not where my leader usually is. Um, it's got to be high enough up where, where fish are going to look up and see it. These fish are up feeders. Okay. Um, fluorocarbon leader. I don't know. I like fluorocarbon and I don't. Um, for salmon and stuff, yes, of course. You know, they're very line shy. For walleyes, when you're fishing in the dark, you know, these, those fish, they don't see the line. You know, you can pretty much get away with mono and you're fine. Um, and I almost like that better because you got to remember fluorocarbon is a resin based line. It's brittle. Uh, you'll get a much better um, lasting leader out of monofilament because it's stretchier, right? Your knots are stretchier. Uh, fluorocarbon is very brittle and uh, the knot strength's not as good, I find. Another thing you're going to want to do, reflective tape on your tip ups. Um, anybody ever lose a tip up in the dark? I have. It's not fun. You got to go back the next day. Um, and a little bit of reflective tape. That way you can watch all your flags at night. Okay. These are my favorites. They're polars. Um, I know they're, you know, they're not the fanciest tip ups. I don't do business for polar. I don't, they're just my favorite tip ups. They're easy. Um, you know, the wooden ones. They're a lot nicer and, you know, they got a nice finish on them and they're shiny. But you got to do the wing nut thing and then there's a the little thing on the spool. And, you know, fishing is all about efficiency. And I can get the spread picked up in no time. You do this, you reel it in, and you're done with those. You got the wing nuts and, you know, the spool. And I don't know. That's just me. These are my favorites. A lot of them snowmobile is on that lake. Uh, well, when the snow gets deep, that's, that's what I, I hear from my buddies that are big fans of the wooden, you know, the heritage and stuff is, well, what happens when the snow gets deep? Honestly, when the snow gets deep, I stop fishing for walleyes because it's, it's over, you know, first ice is the magic, magic time. And then again on late ice and hopefully by late ice, you know, you don't have deep snow, but, uh, yeah, that's the one downside of these is, is the snow depth. But there's a lot of snowmobilers on that lake. There is. Um, you got to be careful. But I usually don't have a problem. So that's that. <laughs> <laughs> so. Those are great, also. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, good point. 
Okay. Um, bait, back to bait fish, lively bait too. Go invest in a pump for your house, an aerator. It's the best $20 you can spend. I mean, I keep bait all winter in it. That's all these guys do here. You wake up in the morning, you change the water, you put the aerator back on, and you're not throwing all your bait out at the end of the day because the guy at the bait shop was nice and gave you 19 dozen shiners. You know what I mean? So um, buy an aerator. Save you a lot of money in bait, and it'll keep your bait lively. It's all about the, the vibration. Um, weather. Let's talk about weather a little bit. Because walleyes are very dependent on weather. Uh, they like stability. The moon is huge. Um, storm fronts, high pressure, low pressure. There's a lot of stuff like that I like to think about. And, you know, you can drive yourself crazy with all this stuff. If you go on uh, any weather website where they show you the barometric pressure, that's your Bible. Um, if you see a storm system coming in, you want to be out there the day before or the day before that, two days before, and watch that barometer. If you see that barometer start falling, that's your day that you want to go, okay? Peak in the middle of a storm can be tough unless it's, if it's kind of a lingering low pressure system. That's one of my favorite times. But if you get a sudden snowstorm where they're predicting 10 to 12 inches and you're out there covered in snow, generally that's pretty, pretty tough fishing. Um, the day after can also be tough fishing. But watch the barometer, um, and it's, it's really interesting because people associate low pressure with uh, rain. Not always the case. Some days you get rain and, and there's high pressure for some reason, and um, you might out, be out there wondering why the bite's not so good. That could be why. Moon phases, more critical in the fall. Uh, generally, before and after the full moon's really good. You're out there at night with a full moon, that can be pretty good on the ice. Obviously, they can see a little bit better. Um, contrary to popular belief, you know, a, a full moon with no clouds might as well be the sun to the walleyes, especially on black ice. Um, we do a lot of night fishing in the fall, and some of the worst nights are the nights where, you know, there's a million stars out and the moon's just glaring because it hurts their eyes. I mean, any kind of light to these fish, these are light sensitive fish. Any kind of light, including moonlight, can be too much. So pay attention to what the moon's doing. Before and after is very good. And um, just, a, just a little bit of light can be very good. Too much is not good, I find. Some of our best nights are on a dark moon. So. What's that? What about the high, pressure? high pressure? Generally poor, but um, again, if there's movement in the weather pattern, sometimes that can be good. But again, I mean, sometimes you have the worst conditions and it's the worst time of year and you hammer them. I mean, these are all general guidelines of usually what happens. Okay. Um, let me see if there's anything I haven't covered here. But, um, that's pretty much everything I, I've covered, guys. The whole idea here is using the, using the technology to break down the water. All right. Um, especially I use the Sackendaga for an example because when you look at that map, there's a lot of area you can rule out because it's just completely featureless, you know, and it's that way all year. Um, they call it the Dead Sea. I'm sure you guys have heard that before. It's, it's really not. It's, I think it's a great place to fish. But the fact is there's, you know, if you just walk straight out into the middle of the Sacandaga and put your tip-ups out, you might be disappointed. Um, there's just a lot. Uh, <laughs> you've, done 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 you've done it before? You've done it before? Get Navionics out and... Um, you know, get it working and get, get imagining, you know, where these fish are going to be. It's just like deer hunting. I'm sure you got, got a lot of deer hunters out here and, uh, not that I'm an expert deer hunter. I don't claim to be far from it, but the best hunters have their stands <coughs> in a good spot, but they found a better spot on that spot. And it's just like walleye fishing. You know, you might go there and you might find a good spot, but there's probably one a little bit better. You're just a little bit off. 
So that's the whole idea. One last question. What about, you talked about Sagi Daga, and you had a lot of comments up there. Um, so what about big time fishing for the walleyes? I mean, obviously, Pretty tough. the mom is, you know, morning, night, uh, I get that, but, you know, on these days where you have the tournaments, like 10,000 people out there, and you know, <laughs> that's quite that, that bad. Okay. It's, um, I've never had a good daytime bite in there. Um, you know, for one thing, the basin of Sacandaga is very shallow, especially in the winter. There's just nowhere for them to go. Um, you know, you might be only, you, you might only be able to find 20 feet of water, 25 feet of water in most spots. So it's not like they can retreat down into 50 or 60 and maybe they'd bite good down there. I've just never done good in there in the daytime. I've tried moving stuff out deeper. Um, it's just always an early and late game, it seems like. Yeah. Do you find that too? It's pretty tough bite midday. Yeah, there's those three, four hours with stretch in the afternoon where, you know, there's not much going on. And then you're right, just, you know, as before the sun sets or something like that, you get that period where you get a nice little run. Yeah. But, um, you know, I mean, and every weekend, you know, a couple of anywhere from, you know, two to six or two to eight, and, you know, we, we get a, uh, some decent hits. Mm hmm. No, I mean, uh, when I first started fishing it, uh, my buddies, I was like, you guys, you got to be able to go out and, you know, drill a bunch of holes. And a lot of times is they're there too. I mean, we were fishing up in the Bay of Quinney and um, up in Canada. And I ran into a guy named Rick Somerville. He's a pretty famous fisherman up there. He showed us a lot about the Bay of Quinney and uh, he had an underwater camera and we were like, where the heck are these fish? You know, they, they show up at dark and then they, they just vanish. We cut holes all over the basin out here. And he said, they're here. I'm like, what do you mean they're here? He's like, look, there's one right there. And, and the fish were just laying there. And it's not that they leave. It's just that they become inactive and there's nothing you're going to do to make that fish bite. And again, that's, that's that whole fall pattern they fall into because they're feeding heavily and they know they have the advantage at night. So they just completely shut down in the daytime because they know they have the advantage. They're going to save all their energy during that starvation phase of winter for when they have the, the best chance at feeding. And that's what they do. You know, um, other lakes, you can go out, catch one here and there on the ice. Um, once you get into the pre-spawn, if the ice is still good, that's when things start cranking again. You know, you get out there late February, um, you'll see a lot of guys start fishing again, especially on Saratoga Lake, late ice, because they're already starting to think about the spawn, you know. Um, same thing with Northern Pike. I don't know if anybody was at Richie's seminar, but, um, you know, the trophy fishermen, they know that once that clock strikes February, for all your spring spawners, these fish are already thinking about spawning. All right, and you got to be thinking about that too. It's just a little bit different pattern. What do you do on the Tom Hennig Reservoir? Uh, fish weed lines. Let's talk about that for a minute. I went over that and I, I didn't cover what I wanted to cover. So fish and weed lines. Here's your fish finder. All right. The first thing I'll do, especially if I'm in a shallow flat, is I'll look down in the hole and I'll See if A, there's weeds there, and B, if they're green. If they're dead and slimy and brown, yep, go somewhere else. Okay? Um, if you look down in the hole and they're vibrant and green and you got all different kinds of weeds growing together, coontail. Um, coontail, which, which is very, very small, like a raccoon's tail, about that size. Not milfoil, which looks similar. Very attractive to winter walleyes. It stays green longer than any weed. Just about that you'll find. Do okay. For clear water versus a muddy or a uh, or? every lake is different, you know. I talked second dog. Um, second dog is always pretty murky, anyway. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, so, anyways, say you cut a hole and you're in six feet, and it's all choked out with weeds. Okay. That's what it's going to look like. 
I hope not. Send your fish finder back. It's not going to look like that, but you get the idea. Um, you're in the weeds, all right? So you walk out a little deeper. You cut a hole. You're on a steep break. You're in 15. You're on the shelf. Here's bottom. Nothing there. All right? If I have to, I'll cut four holes in between there until I see just a little bit of weeds growing. Then you're on the weed edge. That's how you set up on weeds, okay? Um, if you've never been on the lake, you might have to do a lot of drilling to find out how that weed line runs. Does it come out into a point? Um, is it just one small area of weeds, which might mean it's not really any good? You know, so you kind of want to have some idea where you're going, but that's how you set up on a weed line. Okay? My question, I fish in full spot. Seems to me, and I also fish a river, but you can almost, I can almost get the time. So like, I know I've got to be in a spot at 4.15 the next day. I'm Very true. Yep. Same way in the winter. Yeah. You'll time the bite just before dark, first thing in the morning. Um, in the summertime, the beauty of the sack and dog of the fish, now for some whatever reason, some of my best fishing is in the middle of the day in the summertime, 10 to 2. And I don't know if it, that's water clarity. I don't know if. Do you? I don't know what it is, but. One o'clock, right up to one. Yes, and uh, the only thing I can think, the only thing I can think of is, um, again, the sun comes up. They got to be in tight somewhere early in the morning. And I think they're so spread out. I think, you know, those areas on the Sac and Dog, a lot of the shorelines, they're so gradual, it's hard to really pinpoint those fish on a specific spot early in the morning. Right. You know, the sun gets high, 10, 11 o'clock, they get sucked right down on the bottom. Yeah, and then you catch those fish because they're down there. And you know, they're starving in there. Um, there is bait, but they're big bug eaters. You know, how many times have you filleted a walleye on sack and dog and there's nothing in its stomach? Right. A lot, you know, it's cause there's nothing for them to eat in there right. except bugs. Um, there is bait in there. At times, you know, I, I've marked pods of bait but um, just that's that's how that lake is, yeah. you know. There's not a booming population of panfish like Saratoga and you know some of the other weedier lakes. Yeah, it's weird. Yep. So, anyways, that's pretty much all I got for you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.